since this is Christmas time, we're going to be talking about the story of the Magi, or the wise men in the Star of Bethlehem. Now, most people have heard the story of the three wise men who are kings, bringing gifts to the baby Jesus in the manger. Well, you think you know the story, but there are so many things we think we know about the story which is wrong, including just about everything I just said. Now, most people conflate this story with Luke's gospel story in the manger and make it into one story. You're going to see why. Let's read the story of the Magi, who are also known as the wise men, that is in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler, who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then, being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. One thing to note, legend has it being three wise men or magi. This passage does not mention how many wise men there are, although that Greek word magoi used is a plural form, so we do know that there are more than one. The traditional number of them comes from the three gifts, and that's how the legend of the three wise men came about. But it's not clear how many magi there are. There could be two, three, or even twelve. We just don't know. Now let us highlight the important points for this video. We start out right away saying that it was after Jesus was born that the wise men saw the star and came to Jerusalem. They say the king of the Jews had been born, and they came to worship him. Then King Herod was troubled. The wise men came to worship another king. So he gathered the priests and the scribes, who tell him about a prophecy about how Bethlehem are not least among the rulers of Judah. It's going to be the place where a ruler will come, which comes from the prophet Micah. Here's the prophecy they would have known about. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me, the one to be ruler in Israel. The priests knew that Bethlehem would be the place where the ruler would come from. So back to Matthew, Herod secretly calls the wise men. Secretly, because he doesn't want the priests to know he's determined to find out when the star appeared. This will be a key thing to remember when Herod decides to kill all the children two years and under. That confirms that Jesus was no newborn baby when the wise men came to Jerusalem, because Herod was killing all the children two years and under. Here is another key point. Herod sends the wise men to Bethlehem due to hearing the prophecy from the priests. The wise men only knew to come to Jerusalem. They didn't know to come to Bethlehem. Herod sends them there like spies to bring back word to him, supposedly for Herod to worship him. But I think we all know that Herod had other plans for this new king. Then after they leave Jerusalem, they see the star again and follow it as it stood over where the young child was. Notice that the word used is not a baby, but a young child. So this confirms that Luke's infancy narrative in the manger is a different time frame than Matthew's story of the Magi. People tend to confuse the stories. And to top it off, the wise men rejoice and then come into the house. There's no mention of a manger. Then they worship him and present him with the three gifts. But afterward, having been warned divinely not to return to Herod, they go back to their country another way. Ask yourself, how could the wise men of another country have known about a king of Israel being connected to a star? This prophecy comes from an oracle from Balaam all the way back in the book of Numbers. A star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel. The future king will be coming out of Israel. And with the reference to the star, this is why the wise men knew about the star. But how did the Magi know about this? This prophecy is in the book of Numbers, while the Israelites were still wandering in the desert after leaving Egypt. They only stand in front of the promised land in Deuteronomy, where God starts to give the people warnings to be faithful to him. 
And here is one warning in particular. Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully, so that you do not become corrupt, and make for yourselves an idol. And take heed, lest you lift your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun, the moon, and the stars, all the host of heaven, you feel driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord your God has given to all peoples under the whole heaven as a heritage. That's a big warning from God. And in the beginning of this chapter is where God starts to talk about his people becoming a nation. And a nation is when you have a large group of people inhabiting a specific land. So calling God's chosen people, the Israelites, a nation right before they enter the promised land fits the definition of a nation. So what's the point here? The Israelites becoming a nation as they enter the promised land and then God warning them not to worship the sun, moon, and stars? Before we go on, I do want to interject a biblical doctrine about astrology. Bear with me, there is a nuance here. I'm going to start with the definition. Astrology is the study of the positions and relationships of the sun, moon, stars, and planets in order to judge their influence on human actions. But there's another word to know here, astrology, which is the worship of heavenly bodies. Now, nearly all Christians know that astrology would be wrong and very sinful. Only God is to be worshipped. And I would add that astrology is also wrong, like consulting your zodiac sign and giving it power for any aspect of your life. That's very sinful. But here is a nuance straight from the Bible. Genesis 1.14, Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons, and for days and years. The stars were there for signs and seasons, for days and years. Stars used for time, like the earth rotating or orbiting around the sun, or for a sign like the wise men following the star in order to come and worship the new king. I agree, it's a small gray area. So my fellow Christians, don't go looking at your zodiac signs for a clue as to what's going to happen in your life. Pray to God for that. But astronomy, looking at a blood moon, or even watching a shooting star across the sky and appreciating God's majesty over it, that's okay. Even Jesus says in the end, there's going to be signs in the stars. Now back to our story. The fact that God had warned his people about worshiping stars right before entering the promised land as a nation is an important point. Because at some point before this, this had already happened. And if you look up any religious or even secular source, you will find one nation that started astrology, and that is Babylon. Now, active Bible readers will trace that back to the Tower of Babel and the first kingdom after the flood in Noah's time. There are three mentions or stages of Babylon in the Bible. The first one was when all the people came together with the tower in Genesis 11. I include Genesis 9 and 10 in there, as those three chapters are happening at the same time frame. Then the second stage of Babylon was when the kings of Israel drifted away from God. Then Babylon came and destroyed Jerusalem and the southern kingdom, taking the people into exile in Babylon. Then the last mention, or stage of Babylon in the Bible, is in the book of Revelation and the great city of Babylon, where God asks his people to come out of her. In the first stage of Babylon with the tower, we're going to do a video next year discussing Nimrod. But the surface of the story is that all the people came together as one to replace God. Then he confused their languages and scattered them to the different lands, so they can't come together as one. If you analyze a part in the second stage of Babylon in the Bible, you're going to notice something. In the book of Daniel, after the Israelites are already taken into captivity, Daniel interprets a dream for the king of Babylon with the help of God. But there's an important subplot in there. The king asked the magicians, astrologers, sorcerers, and Chaldeans to reveal the dream to the king. And once they can't reveal the dream to the king, the king decrees to kill the same men. And guess what he calls them? For this reason, the king was angry and very furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. Yep, he calls the magicians, astrologers, and sorcerers wise men. You think that's a coincidence? I don't, and we're going to see why. Daniel then saves the day for everyone with the help of God by not only interpreting the dream, but also telling the king what the dream was as well. So Daniel rises in position in Babylon, and we find out something about him in chapter 4. But at last, Daniel came before me. His name is Belteshazzar. Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians. Daniel was made chief of the magicians, and in chapter 5, it describes his position a little bit more. King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. Daniel becoming the chief of the wise men, who are magicians, astrologers, and soothsayers, is a really important inflection point in this story. 
So there are wise men with Daniel and wise men in Matthew's gospel. That's nice, but how do we know they're connected in any way? We know that in Matthew's gospel that the word magi comes from the Greek word magoi, but in Latin, the word is magi. And remember I told you that magi was in plural form? The singular form of the word is magus. Now, if you look at secular history outside the Bible, you will find a Greek historian named Herodotus. He lived in the 4th century before Christ, and he wrote about the Magi and how they came from the Medes. And there is another person earlier who lived about the 5th century before Christ, and that is Darius the Great. He wrote an inscription and talked about Magus, a Mede. And those extra-biblical facts connect back to the book of Daniel. Now, here is where we get to a little controversy. At first, the Israelites were taken into exile by the Babylonians, but according to the Bible, there is someone very particular after the kings of Babylon were slain and the country taken over. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Darius the Mede? This is the controversy. According to historical records, Cyrus conquered Babylon, not Darius the Great. These are not the same people. There's a great reason argument in Bible history about this. We know that names in the Bible sometimes don't match historical records, but calling someone a different name does not mean what you're saying is untrue. Jesus was called the son of David, and this was not literal, but was meant that he came out of his genealogy. Things can make sense, even if it appears contradictory. But the point to this video is that the Magi was a Latin word and historians trace the Magi or wise men back to the Medes, who were conquered by Persia, who conquered Babylon. While the Bible says that Daniel, who was involved with magicians and astrologers, then made chief of the magicians and astrologers, who were also called wise men. And there was a leader called Darius the Mede, who ruled, and Daniel was a trusted advisor. And this fits because the book of Daniel was set in Babylon. This connects both things together. So the theory that Daniel, an Israelite, told the sect of wise men the prophecy of Balaam and to look for a star rising to herald a new king of the Jews sounds to be the theory that makes the most sense. This explains why the wise men or magi coming from the east would know about a star and to come to Jerusalem and worship the new king. Okay, that explains the magi, but what about the star? There's this wonderful documentary from novice astronomer Rick Larson. It's called The Star of Bethlehem. I urge everyone to watch it. It's absolutely amazing. He has a website as well. And remember my earlier point about astronomy? Looking for signs in the sky from God is okay. Here's a spoiler alert. I'm going to reveal what he proposes was the Star of Bethlehem. Now, we think of stars like our sun and billions of others in space. But back in earlier days, anything would be considered a star, even other planets. And I know planets don't emit light, but they can reflect light from our sun and appear to be a star. Rick Larson's theory is that the Star of Bethlehem is a conjunction of two very particular planets, Jupiter and Venus. And when their paths converged that night, the radiance of the combined stars would have shown unusually bright in the sky. I'm going to note that there are detractors to this theory, including Colin Nickel, a PhD who thinks a comet has to be the star. But I'm in the camp of Rick Larson because of the way his theory connects to the Bible. That's the theme of my channel. Everything has to connect perfectly. This is going to be no different. I'm going to explain how this theory connects. Early Babylonian astrologers discovered most of the planets, but the names didn't come later until after they are named after Roman and Greek mythological figures. But the planets were still in the sky, and the people on Earth were aware of them. We know that Jupiter is our largest planet. It even has a nickname, the King Planet. And if you want to look at even more symbolism, it's known for a giant red spot. The King with a red spot in its side. Does that sound like anything? Now the other planet, Venus, has a nickname too. It's known as the Morning Star. Venus is the second planet from the Sun, but because of its size and position to the Sun, it's the third brightest object in the sky, behind the Sun and the Moon. It's called the Morning Star since it's the first star to appear at night, and most importantly, the last star to disappear in the morning, hence the moniker Morning Star. Now this is where we get back to the Bible. Now Bible readers will know where we're going, but follow along with me there's a place in the Bible which indirectly mentions Venus as the morning star, and that is Isaiah 14. 
How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. This is a famous verse, but there's a lot of controversy on this, and that's because of the translation of the word to O Lucifer. Lucifer comes from the Latin words lux and fere, meaning light and to bear. So quite literally, this translation means light bearer. But if you look at other translations, they're a little all over the place. You have the New King James, which I just showed you, translating with O Lucifer. Then the rest are Star of the Morning, Morning Star, a couple with O Day Star, and then the NET with O Shining One. You can plainly see how the different translations vary. But the Hebrew word there is Halal. That could come from a couple root words, Halal, meaning to shine or praise, or the other root word, Yalal, meaning to howl or wail. I like most of the translations, except for the New King James. This is where Satan is thought to be named Lucifer comes from. This is a misnomer. In no way is this text or context of this passage supposed to be naming a Lucifer. I use the New King James for my videos, and I like nearly all the Hebrew translations, except for this very word. I don't like this translation at all. Even if it's just an innocent transliteration, leading people into believing something in error should change that translation. But I really don't have a problem with most of the other translations. Morning Star, Day Star, or even Shiny One do kind of come close to the root word and context of the verse. I say context of the verse because of the very next words, Ben Shahar. And from there, you see, we have no controversy at all. The New King James has Son of the Morning, but all the rest have Son of the Dawn. I see unanimity here. In the context of this verse, Son of the Dawn, or even Son of the Morning, hits the mark. So if Son of the Dawn is part of the context of this verse, then that should have contextual weight on the translation of the word Hillel. And since the planet Venus was known as the Morning Star, and since this chapter 14 is about the king of Babylon, and Babylon was the beginning of astrology, which is confirmed inside and outside the Bible, then that seems that Morning Star would be a good translation for Hillel. I would translate this verse myself as, O Morning Star, Son of the Dawn. In this case, the NIV has it closest, but we're gonna pull back a little and confirm this in a couple more ways. Look at the line right before this, how you have fallen from heaven. Right there, we start to see an allusion to Satan because we know that Satan fell from heaven by the words of Jesus himself. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So Jesus refers to Satan falling, and Isaiah mentions a falling from heaven in the context of the morning star Venus. Is that a coincidence? Am I forcing that connection? I don't think so. We know that Venus is a planet, and technically not a star like the sun. That makes a difference because it really doesn't have light in it. It merely reflects the light from the sun. Let's read something that Paul wrote. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Does this also not sound like the planet Venus, the morning star? It appears it has light, like it masquerades as an angel of light, but not actually having light. And we know from the Bible that angels are symbolized as stars, so that fits perfectly as well. So even the context of the planet Venus, the morning star, symbolizes the story of Satan. And for those of you troubled by referring to Satan as the morning star, while we know what Jesus called himself in Revelation, I am the root and offspring of David and the bright morning star. This doesn't trouble me at all, since names and titles can be taken back by God at any point. We'll eventually do a video at how there was a name battle between Satan and God, with God taking names back for himself. So Jesus does take the title Morning Star back from Satan. And the proof is in the context. In the beginning of this last chapter in Revelation, it says of heaven that there will be no more night, for the Lord God will give them light. And we know in the Gospel of John that Jesus said he was the light of the world. And this is how deep God goes with his word. In that chapter 8 of John's Gospel, it describes the time of day. Here it is in the second verse, now early in the morning. So Jesus says he's the light of the world early in the morning. The planet Venus was the morning star because it was the last star to appear before the dawn. And it connects perfectly that Jesus says he's the bright morning star right before the day, the perpetual day that is in heaven. That's the context of how Jesus takes the title of morning star back from Satan. He becomes the perpetual light right before the everlasting day. This is just pure symmetrical beauty by God. Do you want more? 
Let's pull back more from the chapter in Isaiah 14. I mentioned earlier that the beginning of chapter 14 in Isaiah was talking about the king of Babylon. Now we covered in the three-part video series, and specifically the video about the two pillars, how the stories and context of Babylon in the Bible also duly tell the story of Satan. God can mean two different things and tell two different stories at the same time. He's the author of life. He works at many different levels. So if this chapter 14 in Isaiah is about the king of Babylon, and then verse 20, 12 starts to make an allusion to Satan falling from heaven, then that's not a coincidence. And the fact that the planet Venus, the morning star, is also inferred in this chapter, which doesn't have light and only represents itself as having light, that means that everything is connecting together. So that is why morning star, son of the dawn, in Isaiah 14, 12, is my preferred translation. Now we'll first make a list of all the things we learned. The Magi see the star in the east. Then they come from the east to worship the new king. We found out that it was Balaam's prophecy in the book of Numbers that said a star and scepter would rise out of Israel signifying a new king. We also found out about a prophecy from the prophet Micah, who said that the ruler would come from Bethlehem. So the Magi leave Jerusalem to follow the star to Bethlehem and proceed to worship the new king under the star. The biggest question is, how did the Magi know about Balaam's prophecy? We went back to the desert in Deuteronomy, where the Israelites were told not to worship stars. We then found out that Babylon was the place where astrology started. We looked at the three stages of Babylon in the Bible. Stage one was the Tower of Babel, where all the people became one. Stage two was when the Israelites had drifted away from God and were taken hostages and into exile in Babylon. Then stage three will be in Revelation, where God asks his people to come out of Babylon. In the second stage of Babylon, Daniel is one of those taken into exile, where he saves the magicians and astrologers from death. Then Daniel becomes the chief of the magicians and astrologers, who were also called wise men. We discovered that the name Magi comes from a Latin word and that it's plural, while the singular form is Magus. We heard that the Greek historian Herodotus said that the Magi came from the Medes, which was also reinforced by Darius the Great, who said that Magus was a Mede. And back in the Bible, we saw that there was a Darius, a Mede, who ruled over Babylon and that Daniel was a trusted advisor. It doesn't matter that the two Dariuses are not the same person, but this fits the theory well that Daniel would have told the wise men about the prophecy from Balaam and to look for a star rising out of Israel. Then we started talking about the Star of Bethlehem and introduced the compelling theory by Rick Larson that the star was a conjunction of two planets, Jupiter and Venus. We then proceeded to use the connections in the Bible to support his theory. Jupiter, being the largest planet, was king of the planets, while Venus, being the first star at night, and more importantly, the last star in the morning, earning the moniker as the morning star. Then we analyzed Isaiah 14:12. How have you fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn? We showed how that chapter in Isaiah began with a clear reference to the king of Babylon and compared it to Satan falling from heaven. We broke down the second line and showed how morning star, son of the dawn, was a reference to the planet Venus and how that also was being inferred as Satan. Then we showed how the context of the planet matches the story of Satan, who masquerades himself as an angel of light, while the planet Venus does not actually have light, but masquerades itself by reflecting light. So even the context of the planet Venus connects to the story of Satan. Now we fit this into the context of Jesus Christ at the end in Revelation. We remind you that the planet Venus, known as the morning star, which is the last star before the day comes. And we showed how in the book of Revelation, it says that heaven will have no more night or even the sun. It's going to be perpetually daytime. Then we connect together how Jesus said he is the light, and that is the context of how he becomes the bright morning star, the last light before the everlasting day. Man, God's story is incredibly deep. And if you think that's beautiful, then listen to this context. Only God can tell a story so wonderfully interconnected about how Satan fell from heaven, then compare Satan to the king of Babylon, that same place Babylon where astrology started, and also where God's people were taken into exile away from the promised land, then compare Satan, the fallen angel, who are also symbolized as stars, and compare that same Satan to the morning star, which is the planet Venus, in order to have people follow him to lead people away from the presence of God.
And only God could answer that by using his people going to exile in Babylon, where a king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, makes Daniel the chief of the wise men, which included astrologers, in order to tell the wise men the prophecy of a star rising to herald a king born of Israel in the promised land, so that the wise men will follow that star, which turns out to be the planet Venus, the morning star, in order for the wise men to worship the newborn king, Jesus Christ, who's the son of God, who came down down from heaven. Oh my goodness. And to put an exclamation point on this, Jesus Christ becomes the last morning star, taking that title away from Satan to lead people back to the presence of God, to our ultimate promised land of heaven. That's my God. And he's an awesome God. And he's telling an amazing story. There's a romantic beauty to the Bible, this love story from God to us that goes beyond any words that I can possibly speak. I hope you enjoyed this video on how the Magi followed the Star of Bethlehem and how it connects to the story of the fallen angel Satan in order to find and worship our new King Jesus. Have a Merry Christmas and may God bless you all.